<laughs> Although I do remember when I, my little kid, my kids were little, I would tell the Bible story every night, and I remember falling asleep mid sentence <laughs> myself. <laughs> heard about it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that you? Yeah, oh. read, read the book, story out of the book and it's all of a sudden stop. <laughs> <laughs> Dad?
teams of exiles in the Old Testament. One group had to go to Assyria, the other group went to Babylon, and they went because of the rebellion and their idolatry and their um, pagan sacrifices. They were sacrificing their own children. And these were God people, this was God's people. But they bought into the pagan ideas. And God said, because you didn't listen to me and you disobeyed me, you're now going to be taken captive by our enemy and taken away. <laughs> but in both cases, he promises his people he would restore them and bring them back. God is never finished with his people. Even though we blow it, even though we sin, we make mistakes, we go through periods of rebellion. If Christ is in our life, God never gives up on us. Like never, if you might give up on you, and you might have people give up on you, but God will never give up on you because we have Christ, we belong to Him. And uh, there's a verse in First Corinthians, I mean, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter one. I'll just highlight it first and then we'll go back through the first half of the chapter. <laughs> now, Paul wrote this book we know what, what happened when he founded Philippi. They were looking for a synagogue in the city of Philippi, and there wasn't one. Anybody remember why there wasn't a synagogue there? It was a Greek, uh, it was a Greek city, wasn't it? It was a Greek city, but you had to have at least 10 Jewish men that lived there in order to qualify for a synagogue, so they didn't even have 10 Jewish men. Um, and so um, what they did whenever they went on a missionary journey or even exiles, when they were exiled to a foreign country, they would always have their worship alongside a river or the coast. They would just always worship the Lord there. So Paul and his three friends went to the river and they found three, four, five women worshiping there and the women uh, wanted to know Paul's message and then they came to Christ. And three, at least three of those women became the ones that started the church at Philippi. Remember the, the wealthy woman's name? She worked with Lydia. 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 She worked with purple wool. Purple was the most expensive dye. And that was her business. She had her own business. She had her own beautiful home. And so after they came to Christ, it's believed that her home, which was very, very large, became the first church in Philippi. And we'll refer back to that time and time again. So that was 10 years before Paul wrote his first letter. So they started, they started in the new church. As you know, there was several interesting things that happened when they first got there. They had these ladies come forward, they received Christ. Lydia opened her own home immediately to them, the first church. Not long after that, Paul and his men went on because they they accomplished their spiritual goal. They started another church and they went on. So 10 years later, he's writing back to them. Um, he's hearing about how things are going there. They were his favorite church. He calls them his joy and his crown five, six, seven times. But they had issues, they had problems. We'll talk about that in a bit. They did have problems, but they were still his favorite church. And they were very generous towards him. They supported him uh, financially when other churches wouldn't. So they were his joy and his crown. And uh, we read that one of the first things that happened after the river incident, when they had the first converts, was there was this lady that was uh, working for some Greek fortune tellers and bringing them a lot of money. And she probably had an evil spirit as well because she was following Paul around and saying he's a godly man and it was becoming very distracting to Paul. And he called the spirit out of her. He could just tell that she wasn't of the Lord. And then she came to Christ to the point that her businessmen that were making money off of her fortune telling got so angry at her conversion that they had Paul and Timothy arrested and thrown and Titus, excuse me, thrown into a dungeon and they were beaten with rods. Anybody remember 
what they were doing at midnight in the jail, the night they were beaten and robbed. They were singing hymns and worshiping the Lord. Well, the Lord was so blessed by that that he started applauding. And when God applauds, that's called thunder. And a thunderous earthquake broke open all of the prison doors. The latches all broke at the same time. And Paul and uh, Silas walked out of the prison door and it woke up the jailer. And of course, in those days, it was a Roman soldier, it was a jailer. If your prisoner escaped, you were immediately beheaded. So when Paul walked out of the cell, he saw Paul standing there and he took his sword out of the sheath and Paul said, don't do it. And then he said to Paul, he must have been listening to the hymns, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as well as your household. And so his whole family came to Christ. So within 48 hours, Paul led Lydia, the seller of purple, to Christ and a couple of her friends. Because the Bible says the Lord opened her heart to Paul's message. So we know that our salvation only comes when the Lord opens our heart. We don't pump ourselves up. We don't make a decision on our own. We don't, it's, it has nothing to do with us. Somehow he allows us to cooperate somehow. But he's the one that opens the heart. So Lydia's heart is open. She opens up her home. There's the first church. And within the next day or two, this fortune-telling girl who had a spirit comes to Christ. And then right after that, the next day, they're in prison, and now the jailer and his whole household comes to Christ. All three different types of people and situations, and that was the first early church. Very, very interesting time. And then Paul leaves. Now he writes his letter. We're going to go to chapter 1. Ten years after that day. And you're going to see how fond he was of these people. This is one of the very few letters that Paul writes where he is very, very um, emotional. He's very sincere. And he's deeply in love with these people. He's deeply committed to these people. Very interesting letter. He wrote another letter that was very um, sweet and unlike Paul when he wrote um, Philemon, the book of Philemon. Anyhow, uh, the verse I want to turn our attention to too, because this is the theme of the book, and we'll get back to it in a minute, but verse 6, probably one of the three of the most powerful verses in the New Testament about our security in Christ and the depths of his love and his work in our life that he will never stop. Despite you and I. Verse 6. And I am sure of this, Paul says, I'm sure of this thing, this one thing, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He who has begun a good work in you the day you were converted will bring it to completion until you stand before Christ yourself. In Rome, many, many years ago, I think it was 5, 504 A.D., Michelangelo, a famous uh, artist and someone that uh, carved statues, wonderful, wonderful artistic. I believe I was told he was somewhere behind the Vatican. Now the Vatican is in Rome and that's where the Pope lives and they have statues everywhere and marble everywhere and behind the Vatican in a big pile of rejected marble blocks that weren't sufficing for statues. 
Michelangelo walked by there one night and uh, walked back there one day and he saw a big, it was kind of narrow and twisted marble block that was discarded as garbage. Two other, um, what do you call them when they, sculptors, sculptors. sculptors. Two other sculptors had tried to work on this particular block and they were so frustrated because it was narrow and kind of twisted that they gave up. There was holes hammered into this block. There were chisel marks on this block and they just said, ah, oh, forget it. So it was a reject marble block. But then the sculptor of all time shows up and he asked the Pope's Pope if he could have that because he wanted to make a sculptor. Wanted to make a statue. And the Pope said, take it. It took him four years, I believe, three to four years. And out of that twisted marble block that was rejected twice before and discarded, because nobody knew what to do with it, he carved the David. Has anyone, do you know what the David is? It's, it's, a, it's a sculpt, we call it a sculptor, not a sculptor. A sculpture, it's a sculpture, a carving. Out of that discarded, rejected block of marble that's 17 and a half feet tall. And out of it, by the way, do we have a screen here? Like when I teach, can I have things show? Yes, yes. So how would we show it up there, though? Do you have a computer that uh, I can get full stuff up? Okay, can you do that it, now? Like right now? I mean, well, I'll keep talking. But if you can find, just look for the David. Just the David. It'll take you right to it online. And you can see a picture of this. Now, now. You know the modern art in those days, frequently the pictures are nude, so don't get offended. David's in the nude, and that's just the way they did it back then. Maybe he should do a waist shot up. <laughs> Anyhow, we want to be conservative in this teaching tonight. So anyhow, <laughs> he took his chisel and his patience and his expertise to this block. When you read what Paul just said, that's exactly what God does to us. I am convinced, he says, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He takes who we are, he takes our brokenness, our character, our life and starts to chisel and shape our life and he will not be done until we stand before Christ and then his finished work will be done until then there's a lot of finishing touches that he does in our life never stops never turns his, it's like the potter in the clay he never takes his eye off the wheel he takes a lump of clay, which is us. Do we have something going? Oh, here. He slaps it down on a tray, on a wheel, a spinning wheel, right? I've talked about this before. And he throws a lump of clay and he kicks a, a, a pedal and it spins the table. And the spinning and the friction, he, he uses. Dun, 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 dun. He takes his hand to this lump and shapes it into a perfect vessel for his glory and honor. Although we read in Jeremiah that this one particular project, there was a mar in it, maybe a hard piece of clay or a rock, and he had to take that out and throw the clay down and start all over. Sometimes we feel that way. And so, that's what the Lord does to us. Okay, so you're going to look it up now, Jeremiah, 
Just get, and then flat, let me know when you flat, well, they'll let me know. They'll let me know. <laughs> You'll see it. And so, this was an, it's an amazing stat. Anybody ever see it before? Yeah. Okay. Not in real life. 17 and a half feet. We, well, we, I have. It's in Florence, Italy. You saw it. Okay. He made the torso. Did you say? The top, the top from his head. Larger. So he's, he's, it's kind of shaped like that because you're looking up at it. It took him into account. So he made it larger because yeah. you're looking at. So he's looking down. And why do you? I never looked it up. I read it once before, but his hand that's hanging down is large, very large. And I can't remember why they did that. Do you remember why? It was some optical thing. Was that the top, everything was made larger. It was made proportionally so that when you looked at it, it didn't look out of proportion. It didn't look Yeah, huge. amazing, amazing. Even it is huge. I remember that it, it, one arm is down, and um, I remember the ripples in his arms, in his stomach, and you could see the veins in his hands look like human veins. Oh, it was, it was stunning, stunning. 17 and a half feet tall, almost two stories tall. And, but a master sculpt, sculpture? Sculpture? Sculpture. Sculpture. There you go. I can't get out of here at a teaching without a little bit of assistance from my friends. Um, you put him into the hands of a master sculptor. <clears throat> the other two couldn't figure it out. It was discarded as junk. But you get it in the right hands, and he knows what to do with it. And he is kind of turned. It's not over yet, but he's kind of turned, and that made up for the twist that was in the marble. You know? Amazing. So when the Lord puts his hand to our life, this is what Paul says. He who began a good work with you, and that started the day you said yes. For me, that was 47 years ago. It's the day we sold out. We've not been perfect since. We still have issues. We're still sinners, saved by grace. But it doesn't stop his work. He continues to spin and shape and chisel and conform us to the image. That's who we're going to look like. We're going to look like Christ when he's done with us. We're going to look like Christ. So that's the focus of this text. And he's looking at these new believers. Ten years pass and there's a lot going on. They're very generous to him. They're staying together as a church. They're very, very courageous. Paul says in one point, a um, couple of the problems they had were two women couldn't get along. I'll talk about that later. But, um, are you getting it? Yeah, I'm getting it. <laughs> okay. It's taking a while. The computer was dead. This is an old I will tell you next time. I mean, I'll ask you next time. Oh, okay. I didn't know that we even had that capacity. So it's an old church, but like, you know, you are coming up. Oh, oh, there he is. Okay, so maybe we could just, can we turn off the lights just for a second? Maybe? And he did the chest shot. I appreciate that. <laughs> We don't want any distractions. <laughs> there he is. I see a six-pack. Oh, oh, well, well, there you go. Okay, well, that's the David. If you ever go there, it's no big deal. Anyhow, you, you, he's... He, <laughs> don't touch that. Whatever it is. But look at the, look at the ripples in his chest and his... I mean, I mean, it, 
It's amazing. And the hand that's hanging down, you can see more veins in the hands. I mean, it was that far from it. It was amazing. The other arm, you can't see it that well, but what he's holding is he's holding a sling that goes over his shoulder. This is called the David ready to kill Goliath. That's what the picture is of. So it's David ready to kill. He's got a sling over his shoulder. Okay? All right, lights, please. You can keep that there as we go along. Okay, let's go to verse 1. So Paul wants to encourage his fellow believers to know that God started that work in their life 10 years ago when they brought the gospel and he was just getting started in them. And to be encouraged by that. He loved them deeply. Look at verse 1 and 2. Very unusual greeting. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. It's interesting that he's servants. Usually they say, he says, Paul, the apostle of Jesus, or other things like that. This is the only place I think he might use the service. I'm not sure. But it's a little unusual. And he usually opens the letter with a word that's going to apply to the rest of the letter. So he and Timothy, although they're the authorities, he's the apostle. Timothy was his uh, elder. Although Paul was the church father, their spiritual father, refers to himself as a servant. Of course, for Christ referred to himself as a servant. Servants of Christ Jesus. Now this is to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with overseers and deacons. So he's talking to the whole church at large. Paul founded it. The saints were you and I, the part, the, everybody a part of that church congregation. And the elders and deacons were the leaders. He's talking to the whole group that had anything to do with this lovely church at Philippi that God is shaping and working with. He says that they are in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. I've talked about this before. When we come to Christ, we start becoming a part of Christ. We are in Christ. Now, I think I had a coin last time, but here's a bottle cap right here. So when we come to Christ, we immediately are placed in Christ as this cap is in my hand. And we read that nothing can tear us away from his hand. We are in Christ. Nothing can touch our life unless he permits it for his glory and honor and for our growth. But we are in and secure in Christ. Never forget that. We cannot lose our salvation. Now, you might be from another church that feel, believes that. I don't think that's biblical personally. Because um, we are in Christ. You can't be in one day and out the next. If he's begun a good work in us, and he will complete that until the day we meet him, that implies that you can't be out of him. No matter what you do. Now, there's also consequences for our rebellion, and that he doesn't pass on. You reap what you sow. Case in point, King David. King David was a man after God's own heart. He understood the heart of God. But he was also a sinner, and he slept with Bathsheba, and he, she, he killed Bathsheba's husband. And Bathsheba had David's baby. And David tried to get away with it for a year and a half. We read that for a year and a half, David was hiding this sin. Never from the Lord, obviously. And so Nathan confronted him. You know the story. And when David said, I have sinned against God, please forgive me. Nathan said, God does forgive you, but you will always have a sword in your household. In other words, there will always be consequences, David. And so he remained a man after David's, David remained a man after God's own heart the rest of his life, but he still had consequences. So God works in us. We're not perfect. There are consequences to our choices, but we're still in Christ. 
We just can't get away with it. And so Paul says grace, verse 2, grace to you, that comes from God. Grace is for people who don't deserve it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the number one thing I've heard before that the people in the world are looking for? Peace. Peace of heart. Peace of mind. They think money will do it. They think lust will do it. They think a name and lights will do it. A career will do it. Pleasure will do it. The only way we find peace is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the Prince of Peace. And so Paul says to him right away, everything in that first sentence is that God has started a work in you. You've received his grace. You have his peace. And the good work he started, he's going to finish. Okay, let's go to verse 3. Listen to how he talks to these people. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. That's a lot of remembrance. He had a lot to think about. The day they met the ladies, the jail time that they had to do, the persecution, the beating of the rods, their salvation, the gift of the home that Lydia gave, all of his remembrances, the fact that they helped him financially. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day to now. So they were partners, fellowship, partners. They were the same family. They took care of him financially. They walked with him through his trials. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. I want to show you something. And we'll come right back. Chapter 4, verse 2. They suffered with him. Look at verse 2. We'll get back to this later. I entreat Iodia. Well, let me stop here and just say something. So here's the problem they have. Two women in the church. I've said this before. They were probably two of the women that were on the beach that day. At the river. Two of the first converts. Very strong women, as you're going to see. Very godly women. Very strong women. But they had a falling out. There was a problem that they were not resolving. And it started to have a negative impact on the church. And so Paul knows this. He gets word from them. He writes a letter about it. In addition to all the wonderful things he says, he's aware of this problem. Look at verse 2. I entreat, in other words, I plead with Yodia was her name, and I entreat Syntyche was the other woman, to agree in the Lord. In other words, you might have differences. You may say black, you may say white. You may have strong feelings about your position. You may be a Republican or a Democrat. You may have very, very strong feelings about what you think that clashes with the other person. But you can at least agree in the Lord. You're both believers. Do not let this come between you and our church. I ask you also, this is, now he's talking to his elder, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. They work by Paul's side. Very dangerous work, these women. These women were bold and courageous. I want you to help these women. They work by my side, side by side. Together with Clement, uh, Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These women's names are in the book of life. They worked and endangered their life by my side and now they've had a falling out. And they're not resolving their issue and it's going to start to impact the church. So he asked his elder, make this thing work. Work it out with them. So... It's very biblical. I do mediation, Christian mediation with families between parties that are not getting along, whether it's families or sisters in the church or brothers in the church. It's a biblical idea. It's a biblical idea for an elder 
who were two people, one person sits over here, one person sits over there, everybody can cut it with a knife, people start believing this person, people start believing that person, and there goes your split right down the middle. You ever been in a church like that? Right here? I'm glad it's gone. Let's hope it's gone. If it's not, maybe I need to meet with them. Which I would, in a heartbeat. Because it's biblical. I'm an elder. This is what we do. And so he pleads that Paul brings peace. I mean, his elder brings peace. So that's the issue. And uh, he's saying, we've been through a lot together. We're partners. You've walked by my side. We are the same family. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Since that first day, now, 10 years later, we have been a family. That's what he's saying. We're flesh and blood in Christ. And I am sure of this. I already read it. He who began a good work in you, although there's friction in your church right now, and although you must be under some fire and persecution, like Paul was, he wrote this from a prison in Rome. Although there's fire right now, and persecution, and frustration, and division, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Never be discouraged that you've gone too far and God is still not working in your life. Never be discouraged. Please. That's the enemy's job. The accuser of brethren is to give thoughts in your mind to think you're not good enough for the Lord or you've let them down and gone too far. That is an, a lie from the pit. Okay? And then he says to them, verse 7, look at this. It's like he's pouring out his heart. It's like he, he goes, it is right for me to feel this way. God's going to do a work in you, and he's going to complete it. And then he says, it is right for, it's like he's defending himself. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. So Paul knows that God has started a work and he's going to complete it. But he's not basing it on just nice feelings. He sees authentic, genuine change in these people, and it's a sign that Christ is working in their life. He goes, it's right for me to feel this way, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and my defense. You've hung with me in my imprisonment. You've been there for me. Nine Christians don't do that. For the gospel, you, you've given up your funds, you've lived in poverty, you're going through persecution, you're living in a Roman colony, you're claiming the name of Christ, you stand with me in my sufferings. These are all signs that you are in Christ, you belong to him. People that don't know the Lord don't do that stuff. So he saw proof that God was working in their life. Is there proof that God's working in your life? I mean, there's proof to you, but do others see it? Really, seriously. That Christ is working in your life. And I don't say that to make you feel bad or anything, but there's got to be some kind of evidence. Yeah? yeah? There has to be some kind of evidence that we are set apart. Love. Love is supposed to be number one, which is the tallest order of all, for all of us, because not everybody's lovable, <laughs> including us. <laughs> Believe it or not, Including us. No. Not everybody is lovable. <laughs> okay. Um, God is my witness. How I yearn for all of you with the affection of Christ. That's not what he's saying. It's like, you have no idea how deeply I yearn for you with the very Christ affection. I mean, the guy's pouring his heart out to these people. And it is my prayer, okay, now let's get into something different. Verse 9, this is very interesting. So now he's just going to talk about to them about what his prayer is for them. And he knows that they need it because there's problems. And so he says, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. So what is he saying? 
And another way to say that, your love may abound more and more. Get stronger. It's going to be more evident. My prayer is that your love will increase. Because up to this point, it's been decreasing because of the division in the church. So my prayer is that God will make your love grow more and more. But what does that love look like? Well, look what he says next. With knowledge... That's spiritual and biblical knowledge. And all discernment with knowledge and discernment. This is one of the best passages in the New Testament that actually describe what the love of Christ looks like in our life. It's not weak. It's not enabling. It's not fear-based. It's not wimpy. The love of Christ is strong. And he is telling them, you're going to have to start to exercise strong love to each other. Can we call it tough love? With each other. Your love is not to be syrupy. Have you ever heard of sloppy agape before? <laughs> sloppy agape. Agape is the love of God. And it's so strong that it held Christ on a cross. This is not syrupy, wimpy, nursery rhyme love. It held Christ on the cross. And he says to these Philippians, I want your love to be based on truth, and I want it to be strong, and I want it to grow. But love is not love unless you have discernment. Wisdom and discernment. So for example, let's say you have, I do, I do teachings, I do workshops on boundaries at home and boundaries in the workplace. And many people that um, come to the workshop usually have um, adult children with maybe some kind of mental illness or they're, you know, there's just, there's a lot of needs there along those lines. Or there's people there that um, are enabling family members, and enabling means doing for them what they should be doing for themselves. Why is it not right to do for someone else what they should be doing for themselves? What's that? Doesn't help them. It doesn't give them self-reliance? It doesn't give them the opportunity to make mistakes and learn. Yes. If we just do it for, they'll never get out of that mess. Okay, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I have a friend, she's moved out of the area, but her 40-something son has moved in with her, and does horrible things. And I tell her, you need to sit down for this, you need to have comfort. She says, but God has told me that I need to lay my life down for him. He's even been in prison for a short time. Well, God does tell us that sometimes, but not if abuse is ongoing. Not if abuse is ongoing. Doesn't have to touch her. I've had some women say to me, I would prefer my husband hit me. At least that pain goes away. So. So uh, we're talking. For her. Yeah, it's tough. She needs to get some support. She needs to get some good biblical counseling. She, and you know, when God tells you to lie your life, life <clears throat> down, that's that's. I mean, I I understand that. But 
God does not want his people to be severely abused and trapped. That's not God's will. Yeah? One of my favorite sayings back when I was dealing with some of this was, when you love somebody, you let them go. And if they return, it was meant to be. And if they don't, then that will Yeah, I know that's the saying very, very well. Very well. I had a, a young lady come to me one time. We're talking about Christ's love. It is gracious. It is life-giving. It is strong. It doesn't run after people. You know, the, the Jesus had that attorney come to him one time, and he said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, obey the Ten Commandments. And he goes, well, I have. I mean, I went right on down to eat. Obey. Jesus said, is that so? Well, then sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the Bible says, by the way, when Jesus first started talking to him, the Bible says, and Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now listen to what this loving Jesus says to this man. It said that Jesus loved him. When Jesus said, sell everything you have and give to the poor, he put his head down, he walked away, and Jesus let him go. He didn't say, wait a minute, let's negotiate. Just give some of it to the poor. I mean, he's talking to this guy's specific situation, not ours, you know. He's a very wealthy man. Jesus let him go. What was that? Love. He loved him and he let him go. Well, some believers say, no, 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 no. You, you go, you, you do anything. No. No. Because he made his choice. He made his choice. I had this, go ahead, go. Oh, just go ahead. Right, for the uh, discernment and know the difference between, between what's enabling and what's assistance. I mean, when, yeah. when our kids ask us for help, they just need help. Yeah. And then there's a point at which they really can help themselves, and it is time to start Yeah. Saying. And that's the discernment we're talking about. It's like, you know, what, which is it? What, it, like, where's the line between compassion and enabling? Compassion walks with and helps support so they can get on their own. Enabling just gives them what they need and they'll never get on their own. And it's not love. Don't call it love. So I had this girl years ago. She came to me for counseling and uh, she said, my mother-in-law is really controlling. I said, okay. And she goes, I'm really having a hard time. I don't know what to do. I, it, it causes fights with me and my husband. And I go, well, what does she do? She said, she's so controlling <clears throat> that when my husband and I go out of town, she comes into our home and rearranges all my furniture. I go, she rearranges your furniture? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I go, does that frustrate you? She goes, I'm furious. I'm furious. And so I'm very, very upset at her. And I said, well, um, you need to talk to her and tell her not to do that anymore. She goes, I could never do that. I said, why? Because I love her too much. I go, that's not love. You, this, I actually said this. I go, you don't love her too much. You're afraid of what she'll do if you talk to her. That's called fear, not love. Don't call that love. But you allow it to continue. You allow it to continue. Don't call it love. And so that's what Paul's saying. He goes, you have to work out your differences, but let's make sure your love's the right kind of love. Yeah. It's got to be growing in strength. It has to be discerning. Discerning means to differentiate what is right and what isn't right. And it should be done with biblical knowledge. Christian love is powerful and strong. It is not wimpy and enabling. And I'm a, an enabler in recovery. I think I should confess that to you. I was an enabler for many, many years. And I found out the hard way and I don't enable anymore. 
No, no, I. It's still, it's still a challenge at times. Yes. Because I am a day Well, okay. We should start a support group here. <laughs> so my son, he's doing great now. He's 31. But when he was 18, he's just out of the house. He ran away when he was 17, but we were still buddies. And, you know, he's starting to get in the habit of asking me for money. And yet when I try to give him, get him a job, I got a job interview for your son. He doesn't want it. Mm-hmm. But, he'll, you know, he'll want me to give him a loan, which, you know, whatever. And so I told him, I wrote him a letter. I said, son, I'm not doing it anymore. I love you. You're my boy. I will always be in your life. I'm not giving you any more money. He said, okay, dad. Never complained about it. Never whined about it. So about a month later, I took him to lunch in Ashland. And he said, dad, I, I only have 45 cents to my name. Now, he was living in a trailer at that time, and he still had enough gas in his car, but he goes, I have 45 cents. I go, what are you going to do, bud? <laughs> like, what are you, how are you going to do this? He goes, well, actually, I did some work for a guy last night, and he's supposed to give me 40 bucks, and another guy owes me $300. I go, but you got 45 cents. And he goes, yeah. And I tell you what, hardest thing in my life, when we both went our ways, my car was here, his car was there. I, I almost passed out because I was so sad for him. Mm-hmm. Two days later, he calls me and he says, Dad, that guy that owed me $300 paid me last night. And the guy that owed me 40 showed up as well. Two days later. Mm-hmm. Now, had I enabled him, we would have missed something very precious in that exchange. And he never complained. So I think you find if you draw a harder boundary, uh, you might see God do a good work. Do we have any other enablers or post enablers in the room? Sure, we all enable. All at one time, one time, we go listen like this. Yes, yay, yay. <laughs> it's, the, a hard, it's a hard it's a hard Especially when it's family, I know. I am his family youngest. But I'll tell you what, again, enabling means doing for someone what they should be doing for themselves. Nothing wrong with helping and walking support in a support way. So they're launched. But if you're helping someone, especially an adult family member, and you go to work all day and they're home for the summer, and you come home with dishes in your sink, and they've not done any chores, that's almost a sentence of death in my mind. I told my kids the last couple years there, you will not. Well, your mother and I go out and work, sit around, making a mess, eating food, playing video games, and come home to a mess, like that would never happen this summer. And I meant it. Are you still with me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anywho, that's just some pretty wild examples of what I think Paul is saying that you got a mess there, and we need to shore up your type of love. Go ahead. Well, when we go out of town and our daughter comes over and takes care of the cats, she'll text and she'll say, give me a heads up when you're heading home because it's messy right now. So sometimes she'll She's smart. Vacuuming, and vacuuming when we're walking in the door. Yeah, well, that's pretty smart. Well, she knows, though. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a heads up. Yeah. yeah. At least she knows what her expectation is. So Paul is just saying, you're my favorite church. I mean, I love you. Look what he said. I have you in my heart. You're in my heart. We're partakers. We're a family. We fellowship. We've known each other 10 years. You're willing to die by my side. Now, you've got some problems too. It's called grace and truth. Jesus came through full of grace and truth. You have to have them both if you're Christ-like. If you're just truthful and confronting people all the time, you're not Christ-like. If you're just gracious and syrupy and you never say no, that's not Christ-like. Grace and truth. 
Christ. He came full of grace and truth. Okay? So Paul is saying you have stuff that you're going to work on. Our elders going to help you resolve these issues. That was a strong thing too. If you ladies can't work it out, elders going to step in and make sure it's worked out. That's strong, right? Yes. Notice he doesn't sweep it and expect it to go away on its own. Not even possible. Not possible. Okay. So then he says one more thing. He goes, I want your love to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Be wise with this. So that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And when he says so that you may approve, what he's essentially saying is you want to um, have a life that can be tested and, and clear. So in those days, when they used to make pottery, uh, the best kind of pottery in those days, the finest pottery, was very thin. So if you go to the Holy Land today, all these different sites still have broken pieces of pottery from the time of Christ, and, and you find very thick pottery. Matter of fact, we had an archaeologist in my Bible college who went with us, and we went to a certain place, Dothan, which where Joseph and his brothers brought their sheep. And I found a piece of pottery that was 800 years before Christ, and it still had paint on it, green paint. It was amazing. But anyhow, the finest pottery was very, very thin, and, and many, many times it was clear, which is interesting. And so the finest pottery was very, very thin. It was fire, beautiful, very delicate, breaks easy. So those that sold pottery in those days, if there was a chip in it or they broke it, they would take wax and use it like a bondo and cover the cracks and paint over it. So the people that knew needed, they, they wanted pottery that was approved. That's the word Paul used. They wanted pottery that was blameless and approved. They would hold it up to the sun. And they could see the crack through the wax and the paint. And so Paul is saying, I want you guys to grow in the area of love and purity and no hypocrisy whatsoever. No hypocrisy. Be who you say you are, be honest, and not phony. Sincere, is that? Sincere would be, yeah, that is the word actually. That's a Greek word I think for it. Sincere. So that when people examine your lives, they see not perfection, but they see truth and sincerity. Sincerity. So this was his prayer for them. I want you to grow through this. You're going to get through it. And in all of it, he's begun a good work with you. Don't be discouraged. He's going to complete it until Christ. Try not to be too hard on yourself. And if you don't have a confirmed sense that you have eternal life through Christ, the Lord wants you to have that. I think I've talked about it before, that some believers don't feel completely assured of their salvation. Christ wants you to be 100% assured of your salvation. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean perfection. It means resting completely on what he's already done for you. Amen? Amen. So be encouraged. He who begun a good work will complete it. Despite you and I. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus, for your word tonight. We pray that you would help us all grow in our love. We know that you want our love for one another to grow stronger, more sincere, and full of grace every day that we live our lives is to grow stronger. Could be in our marriages, our relationship with neighbors, those who we have been broken off from and they with us. You want our love to be restored, strong, not phony ever, and very discerning and wise as well. 
wise to know when we can trust or not trust. So Lord, help us in these ways. And for anyone here, Lord, that has maybe a family member or someone in their life that uh, keeps maybe taking advantage of them, we just pray that you give them strength and wisdom and help as long as they're able to and pull back when they can't do it anymore. We pray that you'll use that in the person's life to bring them some um, sense of security and strength in Christ as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I've had parents that have helped teenagers and stuff, or younger people, and uh, their kids have said to them, Many times, I don't want you to help me. I want to do it on my own. I want to do it on my own. There's more self-respect when you do it on your own. They'll be more settled with their future if they can do it on their own. So sometimes, even though they take our help, they don't really want it. Okay. Well, God bless you. I will see you in a couple weeks. <laughs> Yeah. This is a great book. Paul loves them, but he's straight with them. Good balance.